Well, I think my first one would be the unraveling of the genetic complexity of the major histocompatibility complex in man. Uh, that was a major step forward which was applicable far in a far wider fashion than just its application to transplantation, you know, its relationship to disease, etc. So I think that was the biggest contribution to medicine in general. Uh, the second one, I think, is the increasing awareness of the long-term side effects of immunosuppression, uh, which, of course, was used in autoimmune disease and other conditions apart from transplantation. And this was not appreciated until we began to see our transplant patients living uh, you know, for many years with the transplant and then appreciating just how grave the uh, disabilities were as a result of, one, the drugs uh, themselves, the side effects of drugs, and secondly, the uh, side effects of long-term immunosuppression, which then brings me to the third point, was the awareness of the increased incidence of cancer. And this first, of course, was established in Australia way back, uh, that skin cancer was increasing in patients with a renal transplant almost within the first month of transplant, after transplant. Um, and now, of course, we realise that all types of cancer are some that have a huge increased incidence, such as any cancers with a putative viral etiology, such as the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and, of course, squamous cell cancer of the skin probably has a viral etiology too. But all cancers, such as colorectal cancer, lung cancer, etc., have an increase two, fourfold in the long-surviving transplant patients. So I think that was a major um, thing that's applied to medicine in general. Hmm. Well, I think on the clinical side, very definitely, because now we're in an age of evidence-based medicine. Evidence depends on, high quality evidence depends on randomized controlled trials. And it's very difficult to have trials in transplantation with sufficient numbers to produce the power that you require to prove something. And this will only be achieved on an international basis. So this, I think, should be one big area that will require an international society like TTS uh, for years to come, because that's the way that first-class evidence will be acquired. In basic science, I think communication is pretty good already, and you know TTS perhaps is not required for the level of spreading the science around, because you know, with modern technology, everybody knows what everybody's doing. But the moment that you have translation of the laboratory work into clinical work, then you need proper studies, proper trials, and what could be better than an international, well-founded society like TTS to control that. It's interesting that looking at that... Uh, first address, I covered advances in transplantation at the time, etc., and I did say, were we becoming too complacent because we thought 80% one-year graft survival was so fantastic and I was drawing attention to the longer-term problems and the poor longer-term graft survival. But I then said, also what's worrying me is that commercialization in transplantation is rearing its head and um, gave some examples. But it's interesting reading the second presidential address at the end of two years, and of course during that time, what was exercising us because then it became, we'd just been looking two years before at the tip of the iceberg, that commercial transplantation was rampant, you know, not only in the developing countries such as India, but also in the Western world. It was going on in London, for example. It was going on in the USA. Um, um, so that was probably what exercised myself and my council most during that two years I was president.
Well, the first one I would say is bringing the science and practice of transplantation to developing countries and countries where uh, the infrastructure was not as we know it in most Western countries. And this interchange of ideas, training, etc., I think was an important contribution because it was an international society it was much easier for the international society to do this than a national like the British Transplant Society or the American Transplant Society to do this sort of thing. So that was, I think, a very important contribution. And I think, of course, in more recent years, the TTS has been involved with WHO and a variety of edicts produced by WHO for the world in general. So. That, to my mind, has probably been perhaps the major contribution that, in the broad sense that TTS has made. Good question. I think probably Kevin Lafferty's description of the passenger leukocyte in my time was probably the most important scientific contribution. Uh, there was nothing new, relatively new, uh, on the clinical side. I think its main mission must to keep transplantation, both clinically and scientifically, as a global exercise. And that's what I would see as its major mission. Because otherwise, you can say all the national societies can do that. So, so the mission of TTS is keeping the global integration of the transplantation society. Or community is really what I mean, rather than society. Mm. Well, I think the thing that struck me most was when Summerlin gave a paper at the Minneapolis Congress and uh, alleged that uh, human allergenic skin that had been cultured for 24 hours um, was not rejected. And matter of fact, I was sitting next to Peter Medouar and we both looked at each other and thought that can't be true. But at the time, we said, well, he's saying it is true, as you well know, it turned out all to be fraud eventually. But that, I think, was the one point that I thought was incredibly exciting because if it was true, it was a huge breakthrough, particularly for skin allografts uh, in burnt patients, for example. Well, I have to say that there's a lot of expectation based around T regulatory cells, um, and there's no question that they're potent cells. You can isolate them, transfer them in the experimental rodent. Will this work in humans? And I have a feeling the answer is no. Uh, I would love to be proved wrong, and I, in fact, chair the advisory board for the one study, which is a big European multi center trial of using Treg cells to uh, suppress rejection. And I would love to be proved wrong, but I think it probably won't work at this point in time. Mm. Well, I think perhaps one is islet trans pancreatic islet transplantation, which is making steady progress. Uh, I can remember years ago I wrote an editorial about pancreatic islet transplantation. The title of the editorial was, Is the glass half empty or half full? My conclusion was it was half full. I was always an optimist, and things are getting steadily better year after year. Now the question is, how do we get enough islets uh, to transplant the number of people that would need them? But that's one area that's progressing, and I have no doubt that in 10 years' time, that'll be routine practice, but of course there won't be enough islets uh, without some form of genetic engineering to provide what's needed. But that's one area I think is moving well. The other one is in preservation, and um, 
I'm very interested uh, in the warm preservation approach to organs, particularly livers and kidneys, where it's been done experimentally and in humans, and there's a big trial starting out of Oxford, a multi-centre trial of using uh, normal thermic perfusion of the liver uh, in livers that are marginal. And I think this, I have a feeling that this will work and be an improvement on what we have at the present time. Um, good question. I think uh, when I was at the Mass General, or after I'd finished the residency, I was working with Jack Burke on the immunology of infection. Across the corridor was Paul Russell's laboratory, who were working on cellular methods of uh, tissue typing, amongst other things. And I became very interested in that. And uh, I remember going to talk to Paul about tissue typing because my professor had to be back in Melbourne University uh, where there was a very active unit in progress were lacking tissue typing. And he said, could you take this up somehow or other? I spoke to Paul who said, it's going to be serological, which may be a bit complex for surgeons. But, he said, I will send you to visit Amos and Terasaki and Van Road is coming over here to type our living donors and recipients. And then you can decide for yourself. So I went to see Bernie Amos, spent a few days there. Then I went out to see Paul Terasaki. And, of course, later I saw Van Roode's agglutination technique. But I realised then that Terasaki's microcytotoxic technique was light years ahead of the field. Well, one, there's a lot we don't know. Uh, in fact, what we know is far less than what we don't know. So there's still lots of areas of research required, both at the clinical level and as well as in a laboratory level. And also, they have to appreciate that one needs to have good, robust, high-quality evidence to apply different immunosuppressive drugs, for example, or anything else to clinical practice. And so that's an area that all young trainees, uh, and not only trainees in clinical practice, but also in science, should be aware of that this is the age of good quality evidence. So there's a lot to be done. It's an exciting field, and it'll continue to be an exciting field long after I'm gone. <laughs> Well, um, one would be Michael Woodruff, um, who was uh, quite an extraordinary guy, uh, who seemed to be rather dull, but had a fantastic sense of humour, uh, well hidden. But um, he really did. And of course, he'd been a prisoner of war in Changi for three or four years. Um, and um, where he was responsible for nutrition of the prisoners of war, and in fact wrote his MD thesis on nutrition of prisoners of war, but it was classified by the Australian Ministry of Defence afterwards, so he couldn't actually present it for years uh, for his thesis. But interestingly, someone had done very similar studies in uh, Hong Kong with prisoners of war and nutrition, and the Medical Research Council of England published both theses together as a book on nutrition in prisoners of war, and they're classics still, I'm told, for people interested in that sort of thing. Um, anyway, Michael Woodruff, while he was in prison, had one surgical textbook available, which was Mango's uh, Surgery of the abdomen, but it was more a general surgical text, and reading that from cover to cover because they had nothing else to read, he noted there was a question that skin grafts always reject between two unrelated individuals. So he decided that if he ever got out of prison or war camp and finished his surgical training, he was going to study that phenomenon in transplantation. And, of course, he went on to become a pioneer in the science of transplantation immunology, responsible for the development of anti-lymphocyte globulin, uh, 
but also he did some very interesting studies on tolerance, uh, graft versus host disease, uh, and I think is a bit of an unrecognised hero in the world of transplantation.